Throughout all the revolutions in electronic music technology, one type of synthesizer has really stuck around. Subtractive synthesis was made popular by the analog synths that Bob Moog invented in the 70s. In this video, we're going to talk about how that kind of synthesizer actually works, and we're going to do it in a way that will make it possible for you to program your own VST and hardware synths at home. Over the last 80 years, electronic music technology has evolved from making recordings on a thin metal wire to basically every conceivable sound and instrument being accessible to pretty much anyone on their computer. My name is Sarah, and I normally run a YouTube channel called Sounds Good. This is the second in a series of videos that I'm doing in collaboration with UJAM to celebrate the release of their new line of synthesizers called Usynth. In 1944, Halim Al-Dab recorded people on the streets in Cairo with a wire recorder. <laughs> And then a whole bunch of other stuff happened. If you want to know the whole story, check out our latest video on the history of synthesizers. Subtractive synthesis is kind of like making a sculpture. You start with a full sound and you chip away at it to form it into something musical. The main source of a subtractive synthesizer is the oscillator. Typically, you can set the frequency that the oscillator oscillates at and the wave shape of the oscillator. So those different wave shapes sound different from one another, even though they have the same pitch. So how does that work? Each of those wave shapes has a different spectrum. Spectrum is going to be the most technical thing that we learn in this video, but it's also the most important. Once you understand spectrum, I promise you using synthesizers will be 1000 to 1 million times easier. Let's imagine plucking a guitar string. When we pluck the string, the string vibrates back and forth at a certain rate, and the rate that it vibrates back and forth corresponds to the pitch we hear. If we tighten the string a little bit, it will vibrate faster and we'll hear a higher pitch. So let's say that the whole string is vibrating back and forth 110 times per second. We would say that it has a frequency of 110 hertz. Simple enough. But the string is actually vibrating at a bunch of different frequencies all at the same time. So we pluck the string and the whole string moves back and forth at 110 times per second. But also, right along with it, the string is divided in half. And each of those halves vibrate at twice that rate. 220 hertz. The string is also divided into three equal parts and vibrates at 330 hertz, and it's divided into four equal parts, five equal parts, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, etc. So when we pluck a guitar string, we usually think of it as being one sound wave. We can also think of that wave as being made up of a bunch of waves called partials. Every sound in the world has partials, and the frequencies and intensities of those partials, and how they change over time, is what gives a sound its spectrum. So the reason a saw wave sounds like this is because it has these partials. The reason a square wave sounds like this is because it has these partials. A triangle wave sounds like this because it has these partials. And a sine wave sounds like this because it has only the first partial called the fundamental. From here, we can change the spectrum of those wave shapes using a filter, just like a sculptor would on a piece of marble with their tools. So we use a filter to remove a range of partials from a wave. The most common type of filter is a low pass filter. And like its name suggests, it allows low frequencies to pass through and cancels out higher ones. We can set the cutoff point of the filter, which says specifically which frequencies get to pass through and which frequencies get canceled. So if we have a saw wave of 200 hertz going through a low pass filter set at 1000 hertz, then all the partials between 200 and 1000 are allowed to pass through, and all the partials above 1000 are canceled. If we set the cutoff to 400 hertz, then all of the partials above 400 get canceled. If we set the cutoff to 4000 hertz, then all the partials above 4000 hertz get canceled. Another thing we can do is actually increase the frequencies around the cutoff point using something called resonance. This allows us to draw the listener's attention to the frequencies around the cutoff point, or we can use it in an exaggerated way for a very cool effect. A classic example of this is the acid bass from the Roland TB303. <laughs> Although low pass filters are the most common, there are lots of other options. High pass filters allow high frequencies to pass through and cancel out the lower ones. Band pass filters allow you to set a range above and below the cutoff point and cancel out all the frequencies beyond that. Okay, on to the last link of the chain, the amplifier. The amplifier allows you to change how loud or quiet a sound is. And that's it. So this is the basic signal chain of a subtractive synth. You've got an oscillator going into a filter, going into an amplifier. But it still seems like something's missing. It's hard to imagine making a sound like this. using just an oscillator, filter, and amplifier. This brings us to the most important factor in making a synthesizer sound musical, modulation. So it is technically true that I used oscillators, filters, and amplifiers to make that sound, but the sound also changes over time. You can definitely change the sound of the synth by just moving a knob, but 
to make a sound like that, I would need several hands with very precise control over them. So we need tools within the synth to be able to modulate the sound parameters. The most common of these are the LFO, low frequency oscillator, and envelope generator, or EEG. Envelope generators make a transient signal. In other words, they start at a certain point and then they stop. They have to be told to make a signal. LFOs make a continuous signal, which means that they just go on continuously, whether you use them or not. Most envelope generators have four phases, attack, decay, sustain, and release. That's where the name ADSR comes from. Wow. So in order to get an envelope generator to fire, we have to press a key on the keyboard. Attack is the amount of time it takes to hit its peak value. And decay is the amount of time it takes to hit the value set by the sustain. The sustain is how loud it is when you hold down a key. And release is the amount of time it takes to get to zero after you let go of a key. Low frequency oscillators do exactly as their name suggests. They're just like the oscillators we learned about earlier, except they go really, really slowly. So slowly, in fact, that by themselves, they are impossible to hear. How sad. <laughs> you can set the frequency and wave shape of an LFO just like you can a regular oscillator. We can then use the EEGs and LFOs to control different parameters on the synth. So we might use an LFO to control the pitch of one of our oscillators. Or we could use an EG to control the cutoff point of one of our filters. or depending on our synth, literally anything our tiny little domes can come up with. So that's basically the basics of subtractive synthesis. It's not rocket science, but it definitely takes some practice and experience to get used to. That's why UJAM created the U-Synth, which we will learn all about in our next video. So stay tuned. What is it, like 1946? Stay tuned to your audio sets. <laughs> Keep watching your YouTubes for another video coming out from Grandma Sarah.